Hey everyone, I'm Kronos, and this is part 1 of 3 for my guide on speedrunning Honor Mode for Baldur's Gate 3. This guide will teach you how to complete the game in Honor Mode and get the Foehammer achievement within a few hours. As this is a speedrun route, it will contain glitches to go fast. I am currently also working on a glitchless run for Honor Mode as well, so if you want to see a speedrun without the use of major glitches, Make sure to subscribe to be updated for when it comes out. First thing to note is I am currently playing on patch 5, so some of these glitches may be patched in future releases. I will also give some alternative routes for the run as well to make it easier or less glitch heavy for any of the difficult to do tricks. For setup of the run, the only major option that we need is to have the interact key bind here down to a scroll wheel command. In this case, I have shift plus mouse scroll up. This is the only control that is necessary to do the wall clips that are used within the run. There are also some other useful key binds, such as toggle tactical camera. Make sure that that's a key that you are comfortable with using. And there's also some additional settings that you can have. For instance, in videos, you can lower your settings if you're having performance issues. I believe we also cap the frame rate to 60 to help make some tricks a bit more consistent and just safer in general since it's more stable. And for gameplay, we also have Karmic Dice on so we have less failure streaks. So now we're in character creation. So for our origin, we can choose either a custom character, which we'll refer to as our Tav, or you can choose the Dark Urge. So if you choose the Tav, you have less dialogue options, and you have to do an additional skip in Act 3. So this is what speedrunners would normally choose. While if you choose the Dark Urge, you'll have more cutscenes and dialogue that you'll have to go through, but you don't have to do an extra trick in Act 3. For our race, you're going to want to select either a Lightfoot Halfling or a Deep Gnome Gnome. And this is because both of these classes have advantage on stealth checks, which you can see there and here. And their small stature allows you to be carried so this allows you to do some tricks such as getting picked up to have infinite status on your character and some other things that will be explained later in the run. For our class, we're going to choose a wizard. This is because they have a lot of spells and cantrips that are very useful to have for the run. For our cantrips, we're going to choose one of Firebolt or Ray of Frost. This is because you need one damage cantrip to use later in the run, along with Minor Illusion to be able to distract some of your enemies in Act 2. For our spells, this is where it's going to differ depending on the route that you take. For the speedrun route, we're going to select Enhanced Sleep, Fog Cloud, Featherfall, Witch Bolt, Chromatic Orb, and magic missiles. So for Enhanced Sleep and Featherfall, these two are very crucial spells because they allow you to navigate through very tough sections by just jumping past them. It's also faster to just jump everywhere than just running, so that's why we have those two spells. They're also used for big skips by being able to clip through walls. We also use Fog Cloud to skip some enemy encounters because of how it removes vision from the enemies. We have Witch Bolt that is used to do Catheric Fight. And then for the speedrun route, we're going to need Chromatic Orb for Shadow Boxing. And Magic Missiles just helps with that by allowing you to kill Shadow Heart faster. If you want to do an easier route where you don't have to do the big nautiloid skip and you don't want to do shadow boxing, 
remove chromatic orb and replace it with long strider. This will let you do the nautiloid section without having to do the big nautiloid skip, which is very useful for that section because it is pretty difficult. For our background, you're going to want to choose either a criminal or an urchin. This is just for the stealth boost that each of these have. For our abilities, we're going to want to have the maximum number of strength, so that's 17 strength and then 16 dexterity. Then we're going to have 10 constitution and 14 intelligence. So the maxed strength allows you to have farther jump distance. So that's very crucial for a speedrun since it's the fastest way to navigate within the game. For dexterity, it is used for our initiative rolls. So if you have a higher dexterity, you'll be more likely to go first in encounters, which helps in the nautiloid section. And for intelligence, we want at least 14 to have three prepared spells to start with. And then we just put the rest of our points into constitution just for safety. So for our prepared spells, depending on which route you take, you will have enhanced sleep, chromatic orb, and magic missiles. Otherwise, instead of chromatic orb, you can have long strider. So it would look something like this. And yeah. So I will go through the speedrun route first here. So here are my selections. And then you can edit your character's appearance and whatever, however you want. You can name your tab, whatever you want as well. And your guardian character does not matter. So once you load into the game, you're going to skip all the cutscenes at the start. And now I'm going to showcase how Nautiloid Skip works. So we're going to cast Enhanced Leaf. And you'll notice that I will move my spells in this hotbar sometimes. That is because of it being an animation cancel. So when you can't cast Enhanced Leap, for instance, notice that it takes forever before your character is able to do anything. While if we do it and then move a spell right after it casts, we are able to move much faster. So that is useful in Act 2 when we're casting Witch Bolt, which is why you see me move these spell slots around all the time. And yeah, now I will be showcasing Nautiloid Skip. So what we're going to do is cast Enhanced Sleep and just start making our way over there by jumping. So it's a bit faster than walking. So that's what we're just going to do here. And once we reach our last jump here, we're going to try to jump onto one of these raised platforms. And this is because these raised platforms will help us jump to the other side where the transponder is. You'll notice that our cursor kind of locks into place on where some of these positions are. I like to do it here on this rock. So jump over there. And what you're going to do is cast dash, turn on turn-based mode, and cast dash again. So what this does is it allows your dashes to go combine and stack so you can get a much longer dash distance. You'll notice this is a very long distance. And we'll be casting dash once more at the other side so we can get the maximum distance to go to the transponder. So once you do that, you're going to toggle your tactical camera so you have a better view of where you're going to jump to. And we're going to jump to a spot where it says path is interrupted. You don't want it to say any of the other things such as not enough space or target is too far. You just want it to say path is interrupted. So it might take some searching around, but eventually you can see where it is. You'll notice that there's this white outline as well. That's your max jump distance. So you can kind of judge based on around there. And then you can see if you scroll too far out, you won't be able to see it as well. So just be careful with how you do this. So once you find the spot where you can jump to, I'm going to 
aim at that spot and what we're going to do is cast jump and our interact keybind and we'll be doing that rapidly to be able to clip through the wall so you'll notice that happen at the bottom left where you have my keyboard overlay and what we're going to do is right when we see the jump make it you'll see the landing animation on the other side you're going to need to skip the cutscene as soon as possible in order to not fall down out of bounds so let's give it a try here so it's going to look something like this and there we go so once you make it to the other side you can see you're just able to go and do everything while in this combat. I will also showcase some examples of failing the Nautiloid skip. For instance, if you don't skip the cutscene soon enough, you'll see me fall through the ground. Or if you see me jump at an incorrect position, which is either from the starting position or where I'm aiming the cursor, you'll fall through the ground and die. So once you make it through, you're going to cast dash one more time, and you'll see how far this dash can really go. So here we're going to just make our way to the top of this stair step right here. So it's around here just before this uh, like outcropping, I guess. And we're going to just do one last jump all the way to the other side. So it's going to be like this. You'll hit this cutscene once more, and then just hit the transponder, and that is act the prologue, the nautiloid. Now I will show the route without shadow boxing and without the nautiloid skip. So here we're going to cast enhanced sleep. Same thing as before, it's just faster to move around while jumping. We're going to just jump this way, and we're going to go and say hi to Lazel here. So it's just in this direction here. Once we hit the cutscene, we're going to just recruit Lazel, just smash one and right click. And then here we're going to just have our tab jump forwards and keep on going ahead, since it doesn't really matter too much. We're going to kill one imp with our tab, making our way forwards with our Lazel. I'm going to just have Lazel kill the last two imps. We end our turn here for both characters. And then have our Tav keep jumping forwards here. And have Lazel kill this last imp. So once we do that, we're just going up here. Don't have to worry about Lazel being slow since all we need to do is get all the way across. So we're just jumping to this area. This is where the uh, transponder is. We're going to walk right up to this door and we're going to recast Enhanced Leap on ourselves. Cast Long Strider. And then we're going to cast Dash, turn on turn base mode, and dash again. Then once you do that, you enter the door. Skip through the cutscene, and we're going to make our way to the transponder by casting dash one last time and jumping across here. And we're going to start pathing here until we hit the cutscene, skip the cutscene, and then we're going to weave between these two enemies here. So it's going to be pretty precise pathing, and then just hit the transponder. And that's all of the Nautiloid. So after that you're going to have a bunch of cutscenes here, just go skip all of them. And now here we're going to do shadow boxing. So shadow boxing is a combination of two things. One of the tricks is called node fling, which I will show a video of it here. Basically what is happening is you can drop an item at a location very far away and it sets a node at that location, so you're able to send objects over by interacting with them. For instance, a box or a crate, when you interact and open it, move it quickly, it will teleport your stuff all the way to where you aimed it previously. 
So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to scroll our camera in and position it so that we have this rock here at the very left of our screen. And I just want this little part sticking out to show. So it's going to be around here. It's pretty lenient, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Then from here, we're going to press W and D until our camera goes a bit different, which is like this. So it'll look somewhere around here, for instance. And then you're just going to tap S until the camera resets to this position. Then from here, you're going to open your inventory and you're going to pick an item. I like to use the scroll of Revivify. It doesn't really matter. And then you're going to aim at around this rock right here. You can see that it has a dark and a light face. So you're going to aim around the middle of it. And then once you can see this chasm uh, text pop up, you're going to aim two spots below that. So it's going to look like one, two. And then release your mouse cursor. And then that's where I have set up the node. And that is around where the mountain pass entrance is, and that's where we will be teleporting to. From there, we're going to go back to our character, and then we're going to cast Enhanced Sleep, and we're just going to make our way to Shadow Heart. On the way, after two jumps, we're going to pick up this barrel right here. This will be used in Act 2 later on, and then we're going to just keep jumping to Shadow Heart. So once we make it to Shadowheart, we're going to skip through all of her dialogue. So we just mash through with right click and one. Then from here, we're going to cast magic missiles to kill Shadowheart. And then two swings. And just take a few extra if you don't kill with magic missiles. Loot her corpse and then pick up her body. Once you do that, leave to your camp. And from here, we're going to go jump over to pick up this bottle of water. And that's going to be used for the Catholic fight in Act 2. Then jump back to these two crates here. And this is where we're going to set up Shadow Boxing. So since Shadow Heart is dead, we're going to use the Node Fling to teleport this wooden trunk to the Mountain Pass. So we're going to pick it up. And we're going to cast Chromatic Orb of Fire here and onto the ground nearby us. Turn on turn-based mode so the fire doesn't go away. And we're going to open this box we picked up, put Shadowheart in the box, and we're going to place this box on the ground. So notice that it took three damage. You want it to take between one to three damage on the first tick when it lands on the ground. And then when we do the node fling, it'll take one more tick when we leave uh, turn base mode. So what that does is it breaks the box and makes Shadow Heart spawn at Mountain Pass. And because of that, it revives her and lets us go all the way there. If it does too much damage, for instance, if it does four damage and the box breaks, Pick up Shadowheart and try it again with the second crate here. If that doesn't work, try it with another barrel or something here. There's a barrel, there's a crate. Just whatever works. It's important that you don't move a box or crate accidentally as that will reset your node fling. And quick saves and quick loads don't work as they don't get stored for your node fling as well. So you have to be very careful with this trick. So once uh, you do this, you're going to do is open the trunk and then quickly drag it to move it, basically. So as if you're moving an object. So open it and then move it and then it'll get teleported to where you want it to go. So it's going to look something like this. And you'll notice the character icons pop away. So that means that uh, Shadowheart's no longer there in this camp. And we're going to leave turn base mode and if it works we should get experience and then it should turn to night so once we do that we're going to do a long rest skip through the dialogue here and you'll 
notice Shadowheart is back alive. So once you do that, switch to Shadowheart and leave camp. You're going to have a bunch of cutscenes here. Just right click and press 1 to skip through them all. And then you're going to just jump here and enter the mountain pass. So once you enter the mountain pass, you're going to switch to Shadowheart, and we're going to set up the infinite status glitch. This will make it so that your spells have infinite status. Any spells and any abilities that are generally turn-based will remain permanent. So what's going to happen here is we're going to kill our Tav. So it will take around five swings. So once the Tav is dead, you're going to take all their items, turn on turn base mode, and then pick up their body. As you wait, others should attack. So if you don't want to do the route with shadow boxing, what you're going to do is switch out your spells here. So I swap out long strider, magic missiles for fog cloud and enhanced sleep and feather fall. Just make sure you have those three. And you're going to cast feather fall and hand and sleep. And same thing like before, what you're going to do is jump two times to the right and pick up this barrel. But then from here, we're going to just make our way to Mountain Pass manually. And it'll be following this route where we're going to avoid all the combats here. We're avoiding the uh, brains to our left here. We're just jumping up top here. And we're going to make our way past uh, the portal from Gale. So it's going to look something like this. We're going to just keep jumping past scale. We don't really need him for the run. Jump up top here. And we're going to jump just past these spike traps here. If your enhanced sleep or feather fall is going to run out, just cast them again. And from here, we're going to jump into this bush. You don't want to jump too far to the right because the grove fight Cutscene will start. I'll show how it will look like to you in separate video to the right there. So instead we're going to jump to the left here to avoid it. And jump forwards. And jump down to the bottom here. And that skips past the grow fight. From here we're going to jump across the river. And we're just going to jump in this direction down this path. We don't want to jump to the right there because there will be a goblin camp and it'll have extra encounters and extra dialogue. We also don't want to go too far left and have Auntie Ethel's cutscene there as well. So we just want to make sure we avoid those two. And we're making our way across this bridge. Casting these again. And now from here, we're just going to jump across to this side. And we're going to jump right behind this uh, web patch, since there's a bunch of traps. And we're going to jump to this bench, this table here. And that's right in between all of these mines. And then we're going to jump past this barrel and skip past all of these mines. So once you do that, it's the last set of jumps here. Jump across here, jump past these goblins here, and another two jumps, and we are at Mountain Pass. You have this cutscene with Shadowheart, just mash right click and one, and then enter the Mountain Pass. From here, same thing as before, we're going to switch to Shadowheart, who's at camp, and we're just going to kill our Tav here. So it'll be a few swings. And same thing like before, we're going to loot our tab. So loot them all, turn on turn base mode, and pick it her up. So now that we're in the mountain pass, we're going to revive our tab with a revivify scroll. Switch over to your tab and then select fog cloud and feather fall. So these two spells are very important for the run. For this section, we're going to skip past a bunch of enemies. And what we're going to do is cast Enhanced Sleep and Featherfall. 
and notice that our Tav has these pretty much permanently since these turn counts don't start falling unlike uh, Shadow Hearts here. And you're going to make sure that Shadow Heart is not grouped with Tav here and just start making your way down. So it's two jumps. I like to jump on this rock. Then I jump to around this tree branch here. And then you have to be quick here, otherwise you might get seen. I cast Fog Cloud here. It's kind of bugged visually, but you can see it's there. And then we're going to jump all the way across this area, skips past all these enemies, jump down to the bottom here, and enter the Shadow Cursed Lands. And that is all of Act 1 for the speedrun route. That is it for part one of the Honor Mode speedrun tutorial of Act 1 and the setup and character creation. So hope you all enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments about it or suggestions on the run, please feel free to leave a comment down below in the description and I will answer it. And yeah, that is it. Hope you all enjoyed and see you in part two.